Good morning. Good morning. I hope that you had a blessed week. I hope you were able to see God's hands throughout the week. I want to share with you a little bit before I get started this morning. Um, my wife finally got her scheduled date for her surgery for her knee replacement. Um, this was supposed to happen months ago. And uh, they kept sending her to a doctor, they put it off, so you'd have to go see another doctor, they put off the surgery. So they finally had no more doctors for her to see. She passed all their tests. Passed all these tests so they could take her knee out and put a new one in. You know what I'm saying? It's not like she wants this to happen. But she passed all her tests and her surgery will be on September the 2nd. So keep that uh, date in prayer and keep my wife in prayer um, if you remember. Gary, are we ready? Yep. Okay. <coughs> if you don't have your Bibles open, open them back to our text this morning taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. One of the most misunderstood doctrines in Scripture has got to be what happens to you when you die. You can ask 10 people from 10 different churches and you're probably going to get either one or two answers. Probably you'll get one unless you're talking to an Adventist or to go with it. But most of the time, you will get, when you die, you're going to go somewhere. Right after that. But what does the Bible say happens to you when you die? Let me ask you a question. Where would you go if you wanted to find the best information about what happens to you after death? Why? Why wouldn't you want to go to a doctor? Or a scientist? They're limited. Okay? So, wouldn't you want to go to the person who actually made life? Because what is death? The absence of life, right? So, if you went to the person or the creator who made it all, don't you think he would know what death is? And what really happens to you after death? Okay, that's what we want to look at this morning. So, let's look at this text here in 1 Corinthians. Who wrote 1 Corinthians? So, keep this in mind through this whole sermon. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, right? Who wrote 2 Corinthians? Paul. Paul. So the same person who wrote this also wrote absent in the body, present with the Lord. Right? You guys are Adventists. How many times have you heard that? Right? Okay, so the same person wrote this. So was he delusional in one and correct in the other? Or does what he says here also match with what he says in 2 Corinthians? Yes. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so Paul says in verse 51, Behold, I tell you a what? Death is a mystery. But also, it's not a mystery we can't understand because the explanation is found in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because if you die and went to heaven, why did Christ need to come again for the dead? Because they would already be there with him. But the Bible doesn't say he just comes back for the living, does it? He says he comes back for the living and the dead. And Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all what? What does that word sleep mean? Right? Jesus said about his friend Lazarus, he told his disciples that Lazarus sleeps. His disciples said to him, that's a good thing because if he's sick, he'll get better. But Jesus said plainly what that word sleep means. He said Lazarus is dead. So the Bible uses this word sleep from the Old Testament to the New Testament about death. 
Jesus himself, if you were to ask him, what is death? He said, death is a sleep. So let's, let's see what Paul tells us here. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery, or I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, what's this last part say? At the last trumpet. Now, when does that last trumpet take place? Yes, don't you remember that text that says that Jesus will come with the voice of the archangel at the last trump? That word trump isn't a card game. It's the sound of a trumpet. Okay? That's what Paul is speaking of here. You've got to take all of these verses together. There are 2,400 verses on the state of the dead in the Bible. The majority of those verses say that he or she slept with his or her fathers. Right? Old Testament. The first time you find that verse, or that phrase, slept with his fathers, is in 1 Kings, and is speaking of King David. Did you know that? 1 Kings. Okay? Now, let's look at this verse. In a moment, in twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will what? Will be raised. Be raised how? What is a word that can be interchanged here with corruption and incorruption? That word is mortality and immortality. You're right, glorified. Okay? When Jesus comes and he gives you a new body, it's a glorified body, right? What is it that's glorified? This mortality will then have put on immortality. So the question is, is, do you like that? The question is, is? The question is, do you have and are you born with an immortal soul? So that when you die, it continues to go on living. Somehow, somewhere, somewhere. Because this is how the world, and this is where the world is confused. Do you know the one doctrine that every religion on the face of this earth has in common? That is the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. The exception of Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses. Because every religion, whether they are pagan or whether they follow the true God, with the exception of those two, there might be a couple more, I don't know that. But they all believe in the immortality of the soul. That when you die, you don't really die. So, turn with me to Genesis, chapter 2. Before we start here, there has to be a foundation of truth. Do you believe that the first four or five chapters of Genesis are inspired? Amen. Yes. Do you believe them to be accurate? Yes. Do you believe that what they say actually took place? Yes. yes. Okay. Because if you don't believe that, then you can just tune me out because you're not going to believe anything I say after this. It tells you that in the beginning, God created man. And He created him in his image. The Bible tells you that God formed with his own hands out of the dust of the ground the body of Adam. Either you believe that, and it's true because that's what the Word says, or are you going to believe in some form of evolution? It could be theistic evolution, but it's still evolution. And it's still totally against the Word of God. You cannot fit evolution in any form in with the story of creation and God creating man and this earth. It does not work. So, it tells us here that, let's see what verse I want. Let's look at verse 7. And the Lord God, this is chapter 2, verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So, you have this 
body of Adam laying on the ground, and it looks just like him. It's complete, it's total, but it's what? Lifeless. lifeless. It is lifeless. There is no heartbeat, there's no breath, there's no thought. It's lifeless. And the Bible tells you that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God gave him the kiss of life. Now, what did God give Adam to make him come alive? The breath of life. And the Bible tells you that when God breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, that Adam became a living being, or in the King James, a living soul. So, are you born with a soul, or are you a soul? The answer is you are a soul. You're not born with one. You're not born with an immortal soul. That the breath of God, the dust of the ground, you become a living soul. Now, that's how you're created. When you die, the reverse happens. What happens to you when you die? You return back to dust, right? What goes back to God? The breath of life. But is that your conscience, spirit, and self? It is that spark of life that belongs to God. One of the things you have to understand about God is that God is life. You guys understand that? How did he create this world? He spoke it into existence, right? It's kind of hard to grasp and fathom this. But the God that you worship is so powerful and so awesome that he is life. That when he speaks, life takes place. He makes something out of nothing. That's why he is God. So when God formed Adam, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became alive. And he opened his eyes, and he had consciousness. And he looked into the eyes of his creator, and he became a living being. Okay? So... Verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, let's go to chapter 3. You guys know what happens in chapter 3? Oh. Chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Now, how can this serpent speak? Was this really... Just the serpent that God created? I understand that the devil, with the power that he has, took control of this serpent and made a voice come from this serpent. Now, how many of you believe in demon possession? Come on, that's not many. That's not many. Now, if you believe this Bible like you just said you did, then you should believe in demon possession. Because you cannot go through these pages without finding it in there, especially in the New Testament. Because how many demon-possessed people came to Jesus to have the demons exercised? How many of them came to Paul and to Peter? Demon possession is real. And I bring this to your attention to let you see that demons don't only possess people, but they can possess animals as well. How did the serpent speak? Because the devil possessed him. Either it's a fairy tale, a good way to tell a story of beginnings, or it actually is true and it happened. You have to decide for yourself what you're going to believe. If you choose not to believe it, it doesn't make it untrue. You just face what you believe wrong. I don't say that out of arrogance. I say that because you're talking about God. And is God's word true? Yes. From beginning to end? Yes. Then what I said is right, right? Right. Okay. So listen. The serpent was more cunning than any beast in the field. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? 
And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, you shall not touch it, or you shall what? Die. You shall surely die. die. Now who said to Eve that if you touch this and eat this, you shall surely die? Who said that? God. Is God a liar? No. But do you realize that almost every Christian denomination makes God the liar in this story? Because they tell you that when you die, you don't really die? What did the devil say to her? Hello, as Ray said. Hello. Do you not see that? How can you say when you die, you don't really die? If God said, and this is how you come to your foundation of what happens to you at death. It has to be based on the very beginning of the Word of God. And you have to believe that Genesis is just as inspired as everything else. When God said to Eve and Adam, don't touch it, don't eat of it, because the day you do, you will surely die. What did the devil say? You will not surely die, but you will become like God. Paul, again, the same guy that is always quoted about when you die, you, you continue to live on. Paul said that there's only one being with immortality. You know who that is? That is God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay? Only God has immortality. You know where that's taken from? It's either in 1st or 2nd Timothy. I think it's in 1st Timothy. Okay? That only God has immortality. Ricky, do you know where that verse is? I don't, but I, 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 know, the, I know the verse here, so I don't know where it is. But God is the only one. If anybody can find that verse, find it. Because I forgot to write that down this morning. If only God has immortality, what is it that we're looking for when Jesus comes again? Those who are living will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and the living will put on immortality. The dead will be raised in Christ, and they will be raised with immortality. If we already have it, then the devil was the one telling the truth. For the devil said to Eve, you shall not surely die. 1 Timothy 6.16. What does it say, Tom? Who alone has immortality? Stop. Who alone has immortality? That's a pretty, that's a pretty plain question, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have immortality? Mm -hmm. Not in this body, but in Christ you do. So go ahead, Tom. Dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. So who is that talking about? God. That is God. Only God has immortality. And it's a gift that He is going to give to us. Okay, so going back to Genesis. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be what? Like God. So let me ask you a question. Your typical Christian church, are they teaching what God said or what the devil said? Can you see that? Can you see that through the Word of God? God said, if you eat, you will die. The devil said, you will not die, you'll be like God. They say you have an immortal soul, but the Bible says only God has an immortal soul. Who is telling the truth? God or the devil? This is why the true understanding about the state of the dead is so important. Because with this one doctrine, you segue into almost every other doctrine that this church holds true to. Amen. And the linchpin is the state of the dead. Okay, what happens to you when you die? So, you know the story. Eve looked at the fruit. She saw that it was good to eat. But more than that, she saw that it was good to make one wise. She could be like God. 
And what did she do? She touched it. Did she die? No. Is God a liar? No. After she touched it, she ate it. Did she die? Yes. Somebody said yes. She started. Whoever said yes is correct. There was something in her that died the moment she touched it and disobeyed. And when she gave it to her husband, there was something in him that died as well. The Bible tells you that before they ate this fruit, they were walking around in the garden and they had no clothes on. And they were not ashamed. Why is that? Because they had the direct image of God they were created in, what Tom read from 1 Timothy, that inapproachable light. We can't approach that light because we are sinful. They could approach and see God because they were sinless. Right? When God breathed into Adam, the breath of life, he opened his eyes, and God was holding him. He didn't die, right? He saw Jesus in all of his divine glory. And he was able to stay in his presence. Once they ate that fruit, that changed. They could no longer look on God face to face. How do you know that? Because in the cool of the evening, God came and God called Adam. Where are you? And what was his answer? We were hiding because we were afraid and naked. Who told you you were naked? That sinlessness, that perfect character, their pure nature, that's what died. Their pure nature died and an evil nature took its place. Yeah, they weren't just naked physically. They were no. naked spiritually. Right. Because they, they had on their own righteousness then. So think about this. God approaches them and then God makes them real close. Because they tried, they tried to leave, right? That didn't work real well. It's a good thing it wasn't poison ivy, right? <laughs> <laughs> but listen, God made them close out of what? Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Jesus is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. This is why they didn't die completely. They didn't sleep. Okay? Because the blood of Christ was upon them as soon as they sinned. Did sin take God by surprise? No. 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 Okay, so. Alright, so you, you, you have this foundation. You see that God said you will die. The devil said you won't die. And yet most people believe that when you die, you don't die. You, you just go somewhere else. So, let's continue to look on in this. Um, here we go. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. What happens to you when you die? Ecclesiastes is going to be in the Old Testament. Um, kind of a hard little book to find. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. <laughs> you guys have it? Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. Diane, did you have that? Yes. Can you read that for me? Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. This is a verse speaking of what happens when you die, right? When you die, the dust returns to the earth, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. The question is, is what is that Spirit that returns to God? Well, that Spirit is what you found in Genesis chapter 2, that God breathed into Adam's nostril, the breath of life. That word spirit in the Greek is pneuma. You know what a pneumatic tool is? It's air, right? So when you die, and it doesn't matter whether it is a human or an animal, 
If it has the breath of life, that spark of life from God, when it dies, it goes back to God because it's God's. Why? Because life originates from Him and belongs only to Him. So when we die, that goes back to God because that's who and what He is. And you go back to what you are and that's dust. Right? I was going to bring out you. Um, the back in Genesis, uh, you know, we were talking about what you go and it said when um, after Cain had killed Abel, it says, the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know, am I my brother's keeper? And Jesus said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So if it had, he would have been with God otherwise, right? not from the ground. From the ground. Listen, that's very important. What she said is that when Cain killed Abel, God says, where's your brother? And what have you done? Because his blood cries out to me from the ground. Not that Abel's beside me going, did you see what he did? <laughs> turn, <laughs> turn with me to James chapter 2. Keep your fingers working out so we can go through a lot of scriptures. You guys realize you only give me a few more minutes, right? Okay. We don't have food today, so I hope you don't have nothing to be burned. If you have to leave early, you can. James chapter 2, verse 26. Do you know what that says? For as the body without the spirit is what? So faith without works is dead also. The body without the spirit is dead. Remember how Adam was made? He had the body formed and God breathed into his nostrils the spirit. And so the body without the spirit is dead. Now, where's his spirit at? And is it a personal force? Is it the essence of who you are? Turn with me to Job chapter 27, verse 3. Job 27, verse 3. This is where you take the Bible for what it says, where it tells you here a little, there a little, uh, a verse here, and a verse there. And you take the entire word of what it says about what happens to you when you die to form your belief and understanding of what it is the Bible is actually talking about. Job 27. Verse 3. Somebody have that? Tom, you got that? Can you read that for me? As long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God in my nostrils. Okay. So, Job says, as long as I'm alive, don't we still use that term today? As long as there's breath in me? Mm -hmm. What breath is he talking about? He's talking about that spark of life that can only come from God. But where does he say that spark is? So if your spirit is a conscious thing and it's only up in your nostrils, is that what the Bible is saying? No. Yeah. No. So you understand that again, Job had it correct. He said, as long as there's breath in me, and that breath is that spark of life that God breathed into Adam and that you and I have. Amen. And when God breathed it into Adam, where did he breathe it into? His nostrils. So this is a text that takes you right back to Genesis chapter 2. you see that? Does it make sense to you? Alright, so I want you to see that the spirit that most churches teach you is not a conscious thing that lives on after you die. That spirit that goes back to God is just the spark and the breath of life that God breathed into Adam that was so powerful that it went all through his uh, his descendants.